No, the the previous hour, the previous hour to this one. Oh no no, I no? just arrived okay. now. I just arrived now. Okay okay, um, well we're like right in the middle of um, some really interesting stuff going on with with Curtis Hartman. So okay. um, yeah, so you can uh, you can listen uh, to what everyone has to say. So Curtis Hartman for um, Miguel. I, I don't Miguel, were you watching last class? No, actually. No. Okay. All right. So if you're just joining us, um, the Reverend Curtis Hartman has witnessed Kate Swift, who was crying naked on her bed, um, begin to pray, and he doesn't remember how he gets out of the church or really much of anything, except all of a sudden where we're at now is he is in the office of the Winesburg Eagle, and he has told. Um, George Willard that um, Kate Swift has, or that the message of God has manifested itself uh, into Kate Swift. So I read that's, this far. Oh, you did? Okay, so that's yeah. that's where we are right now. You know what? Hold on one second. I think my husband just got home. When we close the door, the dogs are going to go crazy. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. My husband left at like 2.30 in the morning this morning, so I think he's home now. Um, anyways, so um, so yeah, so he's burst into uh, the room telling, um, telling George that Kate uh, is, is a messenger of God. What do you make of this? What do you think is going on here with the Reverend? Any ideas? To the office. No. No. Is is he going to kill her? No, he's not going to kill her. <laughs> no, he's not going to. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> no, I don't think he's I don't think he's gone that crazy. I don't think he's gone that crazy. But I you know, think I think. Right. <laughs> oh, go ahead, okay. Alejandra. Go ahead, Alejandra. All right. I think that uh, he is going to be keep with the obsession of Katie Swift, and there's an. I think they will be a point that Katie will realize of about what what's coming going on. Okay. All right. What do you think? What do you think of the Reverend? Running in and of all people telling George Willard that um, you know he's he's basically confessing to George Willard in a roundabout way that um, that he has been a peeping tom on Kate Swift. I mean, because he says um, I did not understand what I took to be a trial of my soul was only a preparation for a new and more beautiful fervor of the spirit. God has appeared to me in the person of Kate Swift, the school teacher, kneeling naked on a bed. He admits to George that he is spying on Kate naked on a bed. What do you think of that? I, I think... Um... I, I have a feeling, uh, um, I don't know, maybe afraid, afraid, afraid of feeling in the, in the heart of Curtis Hartman. Maybe I think it uh, comes from uh, one on the uh, on the one side uh, he is a is a pastor, and on the other side he is doing he is um, he is taking his. Uh, such uh, this kind of dirty, dirty thinking. So I think he's confliction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he is definitely, definitely conflicted. What do you think he means? What is it about Kate Swift kneeling naked on a bed that has perhaps ignited this newfound passion for God in the pastor? What in the world is going on there? Why would 
why would this image of Kate Swift being naked kneeling on a bed? Remember, what is she doing? What is she doing naked kneeling on the bed? Praying. She's praying. So how do you think that this image has affected the pastor? I think that a huge effect because uh, she, it, at the first time she was naked lying in the bed uh, she, she was lying in the bed naked and smoking and reading so at the, the first impression of the of Curtis Hartman was oh she's a sinner I'm going to I'm going to tell her my preachers to to for uh, to to forgive to forgive her, but when at this second impression, when he saw her praying, he said, "Well, she's not a she's not a sinner." Uh, um, I think that uh, he might think, "Well, my preachers are effective." <laughs> Yeah, um, you're, you're, that's actually really great, Alejandro. Yeah, notice that in the first image that we saw of with him peeping in on her, he is thinking of her as the sinner and him as the preacher, which, by the way, we're all sinners. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you are a pastor or a regular person. Everybody sins, regardless of who you are. Um but you know this first image that he has of her it's that he he wants to save her from her own sin the second time he sees her naked sh he is the one who is engaged in the carnal lust the carnal sin and she is the one who's saving him really because he witnesses her praying and so what Alejandro said about it's not that he doesn't look at her yeah. necessarily as a sinner, but he recognizes that she also repents for her sin. And it's almost like by seeing this woman who he had all this carnal lust and desire for praying, it is like a light bulb has gone off in his head that we all can be redeemed for, for the bad things that we do in life. Um, what do you think, Terrence? I'm interested to see what you have to say. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, but I have some point because what I, what, what, what I imagine is that, uh, when Cart that Curtis feels pity for her. And I think the woman needs God as much as him. And somehow uh, the priest feels for first time in this history useful for God, for himself, and for the woman that he secretly adores. So I think, it's, I don't know how you say, when, when, that, when all the dots get connection? Uh-huh, the dots connect. All the dots start to connect. Uh-huh. All, all the dots start to connect in that in, 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 in that uh, in that image, because both of them need God. Um, I don't know, but maybe this mm, the, uh, Curtis is going to hurt himself or something like that, because I think he is very deranged. He he is very I don't know. Do Do you think Do you think that Kate Swift praying has Anything? Do, do oh, let me actually let me rephrase that. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It it, 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 it doesn't matter tonight because it's, it's the effect of uh, of of the tears of Kate on the priest. What it matters for the history to keep going on, to keep moving. So it so it doesn't matter. That that's a great talent of uh, Mr. Sherwood Anderson that he doesn't tell everything about the character to the reader. So we can imagine. On the past Whatever. and in advance, what is going to happen? What do you think about it? Well, my question would be, does did Curtis Hartman have anything to do with Kate Swift's praying? Because, okay, because Alejandra and, and Terrence both mentioned that 
um, it's almost like he feels good or useful that he's done something to help this woman. But in all reality, has he done anything to help her? No. No. No, he hasn't. Just, just watched her. <laughs> yeah, he's just watched just her. Watched her. <laughs> that yeah, is fine. <laughs> that's about all he's in, done. In, in so. fact, go ahead, was, Federico. No, that was. Oh, go ahead, Federico. No, so, so sorry. That's um, uh, I just a little point that we we read before that he was asking to God to send him a sign, mm. and I think that was when he when he saw her. Brain naked, you say, Oh, okay, that's what God that's sent to me. To the, the sign, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Go I ahead, think, yeah, I think the Curtis is going to fall apart because he, because in in this time of need for Katy, he's not going to know how to deal with her, he's not going, he's not going to. To help her, he doesn't. He does. He's going to realize that he doesn't know how to help people outside the confessional box. Did you understand confessional box? Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Because um, the gap, the gap is, is the same between them. The, the the gap is the same. The distance be, between window one, the bell tower window, and window two. Katie's window is the same. The gap is the same. The same distance that at the beginning of the history, this man is going to fall apart. He's going to to make some crazy thing because he's going to realize, in my humble opinion, uh, that he doesn't know how to help this woman because he doesn't know how to talk with people. He only he only know how to talk to people through the words of God, and God's word doesn't help. Every day, you. N I don't know if he. <laughs> yeah, it's a lack of communication. He can't. He can't do anything out mm. of church. Yeah, it, yeah, you guys are right. Yeah, he, he, he is incapable. And if you remember from the beginning of the story, he even struggles in church. I mean, yeah, he, he even, he even struggles to give sermons in church. His communicate, his communi communi his communication abilities, yeah, thank you. His, his communication abilities are severely, severely, severely lacking. That is for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. But yeah. the most um, strange thing that he can he can enter in the church and and talk about his preachers. He can speak in public, but he doesn't have that uh, vocation to to talk one at one at one with uh, with someone else, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. I mm -hmm. think that is the that it's the main problem that he don't have that uh, that uh, that kind of connection with with the people. Yeah, um, there's just like a really short paragraph left of this story, and 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 I'll read it. Um, I'll read it to you guys real quick. So. Reverend Curtis Hartman turned and ran out of the office. At the door, he stopped, and after looking up and down the deserted street, again turned to George Willard. I am delivered. Have no fear. He held up a bleeding fist for the young man to see. I smashed the glass of the window, he cried. Now it will have to be wholly replaced. The strength of God was in me, and I broke it with my fist. So, um... Whoa. Wow, yeah. he was inspired. <laughs> so he actually, what window did he break out? Uh, the stained, I, stained. Yeah, yeah, he broke out the entire stained glass window. Oh, um, the little boy with. Yeah. Oh, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah, he broke out the whole entire thing. Whoa. And he says that he's been delivered. Let's go back. Um, I mentioned this when we first started reading this story. But he made he made a kind of confession to George Wheeler. Yeah, like he did. He's confessed. Yes, confessing himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about this whole idea of appearance versus reality, and then we'll move on to the next story. Um, fist is this. This is your fist. Ah. Um. Yeah. So, um, so. Um, Appearance versus reality. 
Curtis Hartman gives off the appearance of being this meek and mild pastor who has a very, a very serious, lustful problem with Kate Swift. That's the reality of the matter. He comes across as a, as a meek and mild pastor, but that's his appearance. But the reality is, is that he struggles deep with inside, within, within himself um, for his carnal desires. Then we have Kate Swift. Kate Swift's appearance, or how she appears to Curtis Hartman, is a worldly, sinful woman who reads, who smokes cigarettes, who lays on her bed naked with her window open. Um, that's the appearance that she gives off. At, oh, yeah, a very a, a liberal woman, a liberal woman. Uh huh. Um, at the at the end of the story, however, the final image, the final appearance of Kate gives us more of the reality of her, which is that she is God fearing. She does pray. She struggles with sin just like everybody else, and she goes to God for help when she needs it just like everybody else. So once again, we have this huge disconnect between appearance and reality. Appearance and reality are not always the same thing. And we've seen this over and over and over again. And we definitely have seen it here with Curtis Hartman and um, Kate, uh, Kate Swift. Um, final thoughts, final thoughts on this story, and then we'll move on to the next one. Anybody? Federico said you think this is the best one we've read so far? Yeah, yeah. it's a yeah, great, great, great story. A good story, but the best? Um, well, the woman streaking under the rainy was also a great history. Yeah, is that one your favorite so far on that um, Alice Heinemann adventure, or do you like this one better, Terence? This is quite good. This is superb, extensive. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, you guys will be very interested to know that the next chapter or the next story that we are reading is about Kate Swift. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know her. Yeah. So um, here is the link. And um, Alejandra will start with you. And let's have you read the first two paragraphs for us. Uh, since a snow lay deep. Yes, ma'am. Until fuel for the fire. All right. Yeah. Snow lay deep in the streets of Winsburg. It had begun to snow about 10 o'clock in the morning, and a wind sprang up and blew the snow in clouds along Main Street. The frost and mud road that led into town were fairly smooth, and in places ice covered the mud. There will be good lightning said Will Henderson, standing by the bar in Ed Griffin's saloon. Out of the saloon he went and met Sylvester West, the druggist stumbling along, along in the kind of heavy overshoes called Arctics. Snow will bring the people into town on Saturday, say, said the druggist. The two men stopped and discussed their affairs. Will Henderson, who had on a light overcoat and... Oh, I got lost. Um, he, oh, and no overshoes, kicked the heel of his left foot with the toe of the right. Snow will be good for the whip, observed the druggist safely. Young George Willard, who had nothing to do, 
was glad because he did not feel like working that day. The weekly paper had been printed and taken to the post office. Wednesday evening and the snow began to fall on Thursday. At 8 o'clock, after the morning train has pa had passed, he put a pair of skates in his pocket and went up to Waterworks. Waterworks pond, but did not go skating. Past the pond and along a path that followed Wine Creek, he went until he came to a grove of beech trees. There he built a fire against the side of a log and sat down at the end of the log to think. When the snow began to fall and the wind to blow, he hurried about getting fuel for the fire. Good. Okay, so when do you suppose this story is taking place? How close to the strength of God in time? Is this taking place? Uh, that was uh, fall, In winter? and now it's winter. Yeah. Seasons. Okay. Remember, what month was it when Curtis Hartman saw Kate Swift praying naked on the bed? Do you remember? January. January. When do you think this is? A couple of months before. It's actually the same time. It's in January. It's the same time. So it's, um, it's the winter for the north. It's these these stores these these stores these stories parallel. They happen at the same time. So. Have you ever watched a movie that does that, where like it's like three different characters, and you see what's happening in their lives, but it all happens at the same time? Oh, you just see yeah. It. Yeah, this is the same same kind of deal. For so, example, uh, there's a movie called Love Actually, and yes. it relates uh, the story of uh, each different perspective yes. of that yes. character. Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. I've seen it. That's a, that's a good example. Yeah, um, I also was thinking of Val the movie Valentine's Day does the same thing. So yeah, so um, yeah, so this is the same thing. So this takes place in January, and we're getting some background, just some you know some background setting and whatnot. And uh, they're talking about how this would be good weather for slaying. Um, that you know, the snow will bring people into what, town. What is a sleighing? Sleighing, sleighing is a carriage with skis. Ah. You know, yeah. So um, let's see if I can find a picture. Oh, I got it. It's okay. You got it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, no, not not a bag, not a bag. Um, let me get a picture, guys. A car for the snow. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it'll be pulled by horses. Sometimes for dogs. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Here's some pictures. So um, they're just talking about what the weather, you know, how the weather is going to affect the town, and then we see George. And what is George up to? He has nothing to no. <laughs> Say that again. He has nothing to do. Yeah, he has not yeah, working exactly. for sure. <laughs> yeah, he's not working. He has nothing to do. Um, it's in the morning, um, and he decides to go up to Waterwork, Waterworks Pond, but he doesn't go skating. Um, and then he sits down, builds a fire, and uh, decides to think. So that's go ahead. What, what which mean pond? Like past the pond and along? A pond is, is a um a body of water, a small body of water. Ah, okay. Yeah. Smaller than a lake. Yeah, smaller um, than yeah, smaller than a lake. And beach? Like which of which trees? 
It's just a type of tree. Just a uh. type of tree. Yeah. Just a type of tree. Um, Asad, can I get you to read um, the next two paragraphs for me? Okay. The young reporter was thinking of Kate Swift, who had once been his school teacher. On the evening before he had gone to her house to get a book, she wanted him to read and had been alone with her for an hour. For the fourth or fifth or fifth time, the woman had uh, talked to him with great earnestness, and he could not make a, a, couldn't ma uh, could not make out what she meant by her talk. Her talk. He began to believe she must be in love with him, and the thought was both pleasing and annoying. Up from the block, he sprang and began to bite sticks on the fire. Looking about to be sure he was alone, he talked aloud, pretending he was in the presence of the woman. Oh, you are just letting on. You know you are. He declared, I am going to find out about you. You wait and see. Good. Okay. Cosmo, can you read the last paragraph for me on this page? Uh, sorry, before of that, what means log? Like, a up log? from the log, he sprang. A log is like a fallen tree. A what? A fallen tree. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, Cosmo, go ahead and read the next paragraph for me. Okay. The young man got up and went back along the path toward the town, leaving the fire blazing in the wood. As he went through the streets, the skates clanked in his pocket. In his own room in the new Willard house, he built a fire in the stall and lay down on the top of the bed. He began to have last four thoughts and pulling down the shades of the window closed his eyes and turned his face to the wall he took a pillow into his arms and embraced it embraced it thinking first of the school teacher who by her words had stirred something within him and later of helen white the slim daughter of the town banker with whom he had been for a long time half in love. Good. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, as um, George is sitting in the wood by his fire, um, he starts thinking of who? Of the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he starts. <laughs> yeah. He starts. Think, yeah. He starts thinking of Kate, of Kate Swift, and where was he the night before? As a matter of fact. They have been together. Your house? Yeah, he was at her house. What was he doing at her house? He he went to bring a book. Yeah, he went to go get a book. And he stayed there for how long? One hour. Yeah, he stayed there for an hour. And while he was there, Kate talks to him with great earnestness. Earnestness means um, seriously. And um, he doesn't really understand what she means by all of her talking, but he does suspect that um, she must be in love with him. So then he gets up from the, the log that he's been sitting on, and he starts to talk aloud, pretending that he's talking to her, saying, you know, oh, you're just letting on, you know you are, I'm going to find out about you, you wait and see. Basically accusing her of not being um, serious or um, uh, truthful about her real feelings for him. And then he goes back to his room at the new Willard house, and um, he starts having lustful thoughts. And first he starts thinking of Kate, and then he starts thinking of who? Helen White. Helen White. Do you remember when we saw the interaction? Do you remember when we met Helen White? 
in what story we met her? I think that he was in the part of Tandy, I guess. Nope, not Tandy. No. Oh. No. Um, Helen White, uh, the, I, I remember that scene. Uh, she was called by the person she loves, but I don't remember the name. It was in The Thinker. Remember Seth Richmond? Seth, um, it, some of you might not have been in class for that point, but um, we, yeah, we met, we met her in the story of The Thinker. And, at, and back then, that story takes place long before this, um, back then, George Willard thought that he, well, he decided, he says, I've decided to be in love with Helen White, and he asks Seth Richmond, to, who's his buddy, to go and tell Helen White that he's in love with her. However, Seth Richmond also, well, Seth Richmond doesn't know, he's the epitome of an idiot. Um, he doesn't know what he wants, and he, for a moment, thinks that, and Helen White is desperately in love with Seth Richmond, but instead of trying to nurture that, he kind of blows it and tells Helen about George. So, yeah. Um, Ednardo, let me have you read the next two paragraphs for me. Sure. By nine o'clock of the of that in evening, the snow lay deep in the street, and the weather had become a bit better cold. It was difficult to walk about. The stores were dark, and the people had crawled away to their houses. The evening train from Cleveland was very late, but nobody was interested in its arri arrival. By 10 o'clock, all but four of the 1,800 citizens of the town were in bed. Hop Higgins, the night watchman, was partially awake. He was lame and carried a heavy stick. On dark nights, he carried a lantern. Between 9 and 10 o'clock, he went his rounds. Up and down Main Street, he stumbled through the drift trying the door of the stores. Then he went into alleyways and tried the back doors. Finding all tight, he hurried around the corner to the new Wheeler house and beat on the door. Uh, through the rest of the night, he intended to stay by the stove. You go to bed, I'll keep the stove going, he said to the boy who slept on, on a cot in the hotel office. Good. All right. So we are now at nine o'clock. We are now at nine o'clock of that fateful day where Curtis Hartman saw Kate Swift. So this story is just about ready to start getting good. So um, we are just we're we're just being um, alerted to the fact of how cold and dark the night was. Hop Higgins is the night watchman. Back in those days, they had people that would um, walk the streets, make sure that lamps were lit, um, make sure that stores were locked so nobody could break in, things like that. So this really isn't a, a super crucial part of the story, except for the fact that we know that it's 9 o'clock on the same night of um, what we read before. And... Um, we know how cold it is. So, I mean, so we're, we're getting ready to see what happens with this. Um, I don't know. I would like to say something. Maybe it's nonsense. Oh, but but uh, uh, the, the stores were dark. The, the, street, the streets were empty. 
It was late at night. There were a watchman, the bell tower, the house of, uh, empty of people. Those, mm, 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 the set designer and the exterior are always um, with no people. I'm, mm. I mean, sometimes I think these characters are, uh, are like ghosts. They they move like ghosts in a ghostly city, in a ghostly town. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a nonsense, but it's the way the writer put it, black into white. You know what I mean? He described that the streets are empty, that the dark is closed, that there is no 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 moon, no moon full dark. You know what I mean? So is is the the character are not only inside themselves; they are alone in the street mm -hmm. in the in the designer it yeah no absolutely yeah i mean it it definitely i mean it definitely is is showing that you know this is um it's not like hustling and bustling you know where everybody's out and interacting with one another um everybody is very alone it's cold outside so everybody's in their houses next to a fire you know this is not a night where people are out gallivanting around that's for sure and um, I think what you're suggesting too is it kind of it, by describing the setting it kind of suggests to us the personalities of the characters right. yeah the right. personalities right. of the characters yeah so um sorry my cat just decided to come in so um yeah no that's that's very good that's absolutely very good Terrence so um, I mean, yes, it is a description of the setting, and it is kind of to point us in the direction of the mood, the mood of the characters, the mood of the characters, uh, the mood of the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Shine? Uh-huh. What means lame? Lame means um, that you don't walk right. Like you have a limp. Do you know what a limp is? A limp? Uh like when, when, so what means when say he was lame and carry a heavy stick? Yeah, he walks with a limp. Walks with a limp. A what? I don't a, get it. A limp. I typed it. A limp. A limp. It's in the chat like? box. Limp. <laughs> one of his I, legs I don't know what doesn't work properly. Either. Yeah, one of his legs doesn't work properly. Mm -hmm. Sorry again? One of his legs doesn't work but, right. But just one at a time, please. One of his legs doesn't work right, Oliver. A, a leg that doesn't work properly? Yes, a leg that doesn't work right. Uh-huh. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Federico, let me have you yes. read um, the next. Go ahead and read the next three paragraphs for me. Okay. Hopkins sat down by the stove and took off his shoes. When the boy had gone to sleep, he began to think of his own affairs. He intended to paint his house in the spring and sat by the stove calculating the cost of paint and labor. That led him into other calculations. The night watchman was 60 years old and wanted to retire. He had been a soldier in the Civil War and drew a small pension. He hoped to find some new method of making a living and aspirate to become a professional breeder of ferrets. Already he had four of the strangely shaped savage little creatures that are used by sportsmen in the pursuit of rabbits in the cellar of his house. Now I have one male and three females, he mused. If I am lucky, by spring I shall have 12 or 15. In another year, I shall be able to begin advertising ferrets for sale in the sporting papers. The night watchman settled into his chair and his mind became a blank. He did not sleep. By years of practice, he had trained himself to sit for hours through the long nights, neither asleep nor awake. In the morning, he was almost as refreshed as thought he had slept. We hope Higgins safely stowed away in the chair behind the stove. Only three people were awake in Weinsburg. George Wheeler was in the office of the Eagle pretending to be at work on the writing of a story, but in really continuing the mood of the morning by the fire in the wood. In the bell tower of the Presbyterian Church, the Reverend Curtis Herman was sitting in the darkness preparing himself for a revelation from God. And Kay Swift 
the school teacher was leaving her house for a walk in the storm. Ah, so um, we get a little we get a little um, idea into Hob Higgins. He's a funny old man, you know. Uh, he. Uh, can I ask before we start? Sure. We have some competition in ferrets. In ferrets. Life. Yeah, ferrets are little rodents. They're funny yes, little... Uh, I know what this is, but he is selling in the sporting papers. We have some competition of ferrets. They raise of ferrets. Um, I, to be quite honest, I have no idea why they raise ferrets, Christoph. I really don't. I'm... Sh um, I want to say that they used to hunt them, but I'm I, that I'm not sure of either. So I'd have to get back to you on that. I actually have no idea. So uh, yeah. they, they sell in the sporting papers. Yeah, sporting sporting papers is usually like for hunters or farmers. I don't know. Maybe they raise them for like their fur, um, ferret fur. I don't know, but I will find out for you. I will find well, out. This is not sport about baseball or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, yeah, because no. <laughs> I, I was confused. I was thinking so you have some race of ferrets. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. No ferret racing. No ferret racing. So, um, yeah, so. so, so what is this a, a, a ferret breeder? Or breeder a ferret of ferrets? A, it's a rodent. A ferret's a rodent, and somebody who breeds them is one who gets males and females and breeds them so that they have babies. A, a breeder, the, the ferret are a, what? A ferret is a dog? No, it's a rodent. It's a rodent, like a mouse. Ah, a ferret is, is a rodent like a mouse. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... What does a a professional a professional breeder of ferrets? It's just somebody who breeds them. And for what? That's what Christoph was. Yeah, to sell them. To earn some to to earn some extra money. Selling them? Yes, this is a uh, like a thing. Or feather and meat. So this guy was thinking to uh, grow up, grow up this kind of rudder, and yes. after that sell it to make yes. some money. Absolutely, yeah. like a man. And who and who bought these animals? Say that again. A sportman in pursuit of rabbits. Yeah, like hunters. Yeah, they have to feed their. So, so you let the, this ferret out, and after that you you shoot it with a arm or something like that. That's what we were trying yeah. to figure out. I'm really, to be quite honest, I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure. I don't know if the if the ferrets if they use them like dogs to chase rabbits. I don't know. So, I told Kristoff I'd get back to him on that. What? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, um, we see. So this is that's that's a little bit of Hob Higgins. Um, and then we are seeing the three people who are awake in Winesburg. We have George Willard who is pretending to be working, but he's still thinking about Kate Swift. We have the Reverend Curtis Hartman, who we know is thinking about Kate Swift in the bell tower. And we also have Kate Swift herself, who is actually um, dis deciding to take a walk out in this storm. So we can probably guess that something is bothering Kate Swift. Um, I'll read this last paragraph of this page, and then we'll go ahead and continue. It was past 10 o'clock when Kate Swift set out, and the walk was unpremeditated. It was as though the man and the boy, by thinking of her, had driven her forth into the wintry streets. 
Aunt Elizabeth Swift had gone to the county seat concerning some business in connection with mortgages in which she had money invested and would not be back until the next day. By a huge stove called a base burner in the living room of the house sat the daughter reading a book. Suddenly she sprang to her feet and snatching a cloak from a rack by the front door ran out of the house. So Kate Swift decides to go on a walk a little after 10 o'clock at night. Um, her mother is out of town. Um, and the writer suggests that the thoughts of Curtis Hartman and the thoughts of George Willard is really what is, um, is, is somehow like mysteriously driving her to go out on this walk. So, um, cause she, she wasn't like, she didn't think to herself, oh, I'm going to go on a walk. Um, it says it was unpremeditated. Premeditated means that you think about you something you plan. that you've planned. Yeah. yeah, that you've planned to do it. And this walk, she did not plan. So it's almost like something outside of herself is, uh, prompting her to go on this walk. Um, Christoph, can you go ahead and read the next three paragraphs for me? Yes. At the age of 30, Kate Swift was not known in Wensburg as pretty woman. Her complexion was not good and her face was covered with blotches that indicated ill health. Alone in the night, in the winter streets, she was lovely. Her back was straight, her shoulders square, and her features were as uh, the features of tiny god goddess on a pa pedestal in a garden in the dim light of summer evening. During the afternoon, the school teacher had been to see Dr. Willing concerning her health. The doctor had scold, scolded uh, her and uh, had declared that she was in danger of losing her he hearing. Hearing, uh, hearing. hearing. Uh -huh. yeah. It was uh, foolish for Kate Swift to be abroad in the storm. Foolish and perhaps dangerous. The woman in the street did not remember remember the words of the doctor and would not have turned back had she remembered. Uh, she was very cold, but after walking for five minutes, no longer m minded the cold. Uh, first, she went to the end of her own street and then across a pair of her skulls uh, set in the ground before a uh, feet barn and into Trenion Pike. Uh, along to Trenion Pike she went to Ned Winters barn and turning east followed a street of love frame houses that led over Gospel Hill and into Sucker Road and ran down a shallow valley past Ike's Smith's chicken uh, farm to uh, Waterwood's Pond. As she went along the bold, excited mood that had drive, driven her out of doors past and then return again. Good. Okay, so <clears throat> we see that Kate Swift is not as beautiful as we once thought her to be. Um, she has issues. She has health issues. Um, her face is blotchy, indicating that she's not healthy. Um, the doctor has just told her that she's in danger of losing her hearing. Um, but yet when she moves at this point in time, at night, when she's moving about, how does she look? 
gorgeous. She looks very well. Yeah, she looks beautiful. In fact, she's described as looking lovely and looking like a goddess. So it's almost like she's one of those people that, as long as you don't get too close, <laughs> or depending on what kind of light you see her in, she looks really good. In, so, in night and in the storm, a woman can, could look different. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and she seems to be kind of like on a mission, so to speak. You know, she didn't remember that the doctor had told her about her hearing, but the text tell us, tells us that even if she had remembered, she wasn't going to, it wouldn't have made her turn back out of the storm. Um, and she's just kind of, you know, she's, she's walking along, she goes to the end of her street, then she goes across a pair of uh, hay scales. Hay scales are just uh, literally uh, scales that weigh hay. Um, and then um, she uh, walks, or she she goes to Ned Winter's barn, turns east. She's just she's walking all over the place, um, and she is somewhat excited. We don't know what about, but the text tells us as she went along. The bold, excited mood that had driven her out of doors passed and then returned again. So she's probably, in some at some points in time, she's probably thinking, oh my God, what am I doing out here? It's freezing. But that in other times, she gets this very excited mood of that she's out there for some reason. Some reason. Um... Oliver, can I have you read the next two paragraphs for me? There was something bitter and forbidden in the character of Kate Swift. Everyone felt it. In the schoolroom, she was silent, cold, and stern, and yet in an odd way, very close to her publish. Once in a long while, something seemed to have come over her, and she was happy. All of the children in the schoolroom felt the effect of her happiness. For a time, they did, did not work but sat back in their chairs and looked at her. With hand clasped behind her, back to the school, teacher walked up and down in the schoolroom and talked very briefly. It did not seem to matter what subject came into her mind. Once she talked to the children of Charles Lamb and made it up strange, Intimated little stories concerning the life of the dead winter. The stories were told with the air of one who had lived in a house with Charles Lamb and knew all secrets of his private life. The children were somewhat confused, thinking Charles Lamb must be someone who had once lived in Westworld. Good. Um, Terence, can you um, continue for us? The next, uh, finish this page. Oh, I think you're on mute, Terrence. Take yourself off mute. I think you can hear you. Terrence, are you alive? Sorry, I had a problem with the computer. With the computer. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Sorry. Sorry. No uh, problem. From uh, from on another occasion. Uh, from what a bragging! What a bragging! Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I am lost. We are in page. Page three. From, an, from on another occasion, I guess. No, um. Second a paragraph from bottom. Yeah. On it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, on another occasion, I apologize. Oh, don't, don't worry. It, it, it was my fault. I was I, I was lost. Two paragraph or or, or just one? Uh, both. Go ahead and finish both. the page for us. Yeah. Okay. On another occasion, the teacher talked to the children of Benvenuto Cellini. That time, the love. What a bragging, blustering, brave, lovable fellow she made of the old artist. Concerning him, also she invented anecdotes. There was one of a German music teacher who had a room about Cellini lodgings in the city of Milan that made the boys go. 
Sugar Magnus, a fat boy with red cheeks, laughed so hard that he became dizzy and fell off his seat, and Kate Street laughed with him. Then suddenly she became again cold and stern. On the winter night, when she walked through the deserted snow-covered street, a crisis had come into the life of the school teacher. As though no one in Westbrook would have suspected, her life had been very adventurous. It was still adventurous. Day by day, as she worked in the schoolroom or worked in the street, grief, hope, and desire fought within her. Behind a cold exterior, the most extraordinary events transpired in her mind. The people of the town thought of her as a confirmed old maid, and because she spoke sharply and went her own way through her lacking in all the human feeling that did so much to make a martyr own lives. In reality, she was the most eagerly passionate soul among them, and more than once in the five years since she had come back from her travels to settle in Wentworth and become a school teacher, have been compelled to go out of the house and walk half through the night fighting out some battle running, running within. Once on a night when he travels to settle in Wentworth and be once once on a night when it rained, she had stayed out six hours, and when she came home and had a quarrel without. Elizabeth Street, I am glad you are not a man, said the mother sharply. More than once I have waited for your father to come home, not knowing what new mess he had got into. I have had my share of uncertainty, and you cannot blame me if I don't want to see the worst side of him reproduce in you. Sorry. Good. No, very good. Very good. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so um, what is Kate Swift's personality? What is her personality? Um, we know that she's a teacher. Is she a good teacher? She, well, sometimes make good class with her pupils, it seems to be. Yeah, she's a great teacher. She's really good at what she does. She's just Dangerous. a little... Yeah, she's she's she and she just she's a little bipolar. Um, yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes yeah. she's really happy, and other times she's really cold and stern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah. quiet. She, yeah, exactly. She kind of, I mean, she goes up Two and down. Two personalities. Yeah. Yeah, she definitely goes up and down. Um, has she ever been married? No, but she had a lot of no. affairs. No. No, possibly. Yeah, she's possibly, yeah, she, yeah, she's had some affairs with men. And um how does the town look at her? Mm, in fact, like, uh, uh, old maid. Yeah, they look at her as an old maid, exactly. Yeah. They look at her as an old maid because she's never been married. You know, she she's a 